Hi, I'm Keith Gosland. I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Ann Charles. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. It's Tuesday, January 19th. We're taping in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. So now let's go to Keith for some headlines. Alrighty, so I want to start by acknowledging that January 27th, is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And that this was established by the UN in 2005, and it's the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. So, so we're gonna start with the trivia question that someone might have guessed correctly. <coughs> this is inauguration week. There will be the Power of Unity LGBTQ inaugural ball. It's a virtual event. Billy Porter is the headliner. Ooh, I want to be. It there. is being spot. You can you can register online, and I think it was free registration. Good. And it's sponsored by the National LGBTQ Chambers of Commerce. So we finally made it as an inaugural event. When? was the first time we were included. Who's presidency? So I want to acknowledge that the LGBTQ town hall forums will have started by the time this airs, but they will be running through March 2nd. <coughs> Please look for forums of interest. Please come and participate. But Linda has been busy putting it on the All Things, the Alliance, and the Pride Centers site, and Rainbow Umbrellas site. Rainbow Umbrella, site. yes. Also want to acknowledge that on Saturday, February 6th, 7.30, <coughs> that the Chandler Performing Arts Center will be doing their Pride Theater presentation of Raggedy and. And it's a $12 suggested donation, and it goes to Glad, and it, benefits GLAD's Transgender Rights Project. And you know who's going to facilitate the talk back? Christine no? Holquist. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Yes. Very good. Mm -hmm. Also acknowledging momentum, the coffee <clears throat> and chat is happening on Sunday, the 24th at 11 a.m. Also, be looking <coughs> at the Pride Center of Vermont out in the open and Queer Connects websites because everyone is trying to sponsor ongoing virtual events. And speaking of websites and organizing and Rutland that we don't talk about a great deal, mm -hmm. apparently the group in Rutland <coughs> has reached out to and is looking at establishing a collaborative relationship with Queer Connect. Mm. So there will be a Queer Connect Bennington and a Queer Connect Rutland. And there may be an upcoming interview where we will get to talk about how this is happening and why. Um, Teach Out Vermont, which is an organization for LGBTQ plus educators, and you can find their website. They're looking for LGBTQ plus educators in Vermont to come join them and looking at how they can bring about change in our schools. What about retirees, too? I know a few retire people. People, teachers who are retired, would they be, you think? Um, I, I would suggest you go onto their website and look. I just saw the request, mm -hmm. please come join us. Um, and now a bit of, I wish I didn't have to report on this. Mm -hmm. And it's a follow-up to the traffic stop study. And this has been an ongoing joint venture <coughs> between UVM Cornell University. <clears throat> and they actually went back and looked at the last five years worth of data. And what did it tell you about traffic stops and racial bias in Vermont? And it didn't come out looking good. No. And as much as fair and impartial policing have put an effort into doing education and implicit bias training. They haven't seen the indicators that would show that there's racial bias in law enforcement in Vermont changing. Mm -hmm. And what was really striking was, you know, they made the direct statement that, yes, indeed, driving while black 
know, if you are a person of color, you are at increased risk of being stopped, being ticketed, your vehicle being searched or being arrested. And what was striking to me is that <clears throat> in general, black drivers are 3.5 times more likely to be stopped than white drivers. People who are perceived to be Hispanic, 3.9 times Ooh. greater. But in as far as having your vehicle searched, if you're a person of color in Brattleboro, you're nine times <clears throat> more likely to be stopped, searched. I'm, I mean, I found it staggering. Mm. And really quickly, legislatively, um, they're spending a lot of time right now in what I refer to as their getting to know you session. They're telling the new legislators, this is what we do in this committee. Here are some of the pieces of legislation we passed before we may want to look at again, bringing in those people from state government secretaries, commissioners to talk about what they do, how they interact with the <coughs> legislature. But in the process, they were able to pass one bill already, hmm. which is H48. And it's already been signed into law by the governor and this allows municipalities to change the protocols for town meeting day. Hmm. So mail-in ballots, some towns delaying when they hold town meeting day, you know, looking at doing Australian ballots instead of in-person voting. Hmm. And it allows this, the Secretary of State to generate mail-in ballots and they appropriated $2 million to make this happen. Good. So what you got? Yeah. Well, North Carolina cities began passing Historic non-discrimination laws. New sheriff is first lesbian to hold this, to hold a position in any Ohio county. <coughs> Gay representative Sean Patrick Maloney was ready to fight the mob in the Capitol. We'll have more about that. Stonewall vet Miss Mayor and her partner are new parents. Stonewall vet and trans icon Miss Major Griffin Gracie and her partner Beck recently welcomed a new child into the world. Ken Jones, a pioneering black gay activist, dies at 70. He worked for years trying to desegregate the LGBTQ movement. Missing trans woman Natasha Kiana has been found dead in Detroit. She'd been missing since December 26th. Andrew Day is riveting as by blues singer Billie Holiday, and we'll have a clip about that show later, that movie. Conservatives want a new target in their culture, so they pick trans kids. COVID claims Judith Kolb at 89. She was a stand-in mother for Atlanta's LGBT community. Her daughter Cindy remembers she was scared <clears throat> and crying when she came out to her mom. But Judith just dived into reading books and educating herself. Eventually, she became the president of PFLAG and was there helping people for 20 years. Attorney and lesbian Roberta Kaplan is about to make Trump's life extremely difficult. Arizona representatives target Cindy McCain. We'll have more about that. And Kim Jackson takes office as Georgia's first LGBTQ senator. So those are my headlines. And state senator? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I have some news. Uh, a European Court of Human Rights finds Croatian response to violent homophobic attack fosters impunity for a hate crime. What happened was a lesbian was approached, it might have been a heterosexual bar, she was approached by a man in a bar and turned him down and said she was a lesbian and he beat her up and threatened to rape her. And it was a horrible experience and so the police came and they charged the person but they only fined him 40 euros and charged him with a misdemeanor. So the European Court of Human Rights said, you know, this is 
totally inadequate. Um, so Croatia does have hate crime legislation, but it needs to have teeth. <laughs> um, European Parliament LGBTI group is critical of the Latvian move to define family in the Constitution. So there's a national party, I think it's called the National Alliance, um, that has submitted a bill to the Latvian parliament, which is called the Seima, to define family only in heterosexual terms. So a group of 150 European parliament members has condemned this action. So we'll see how that develops. Um, Cayman Islands, back there, the Privy Council finally <laughs> has set a date for a same-sex marriage appeal. Now, we've seen pictures of those poor women who tried to get married. Mm -hmm. The judge said, good, go ahead. But then the government said, no, 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 you're legislating from the bench. So um, they overturned his decision. So now the Privy Council has set February 23rd as a date for the hearing because they're challenging the government's appeal ruling that passed. So um, I'm back, so it's time to return to Poland. Um, <laughs> They've missed you. <laughs> <laughs> I have before you now a picture of uh, three uh, protesters um, protesting the trial of three, um, you may recall that in 2019, I reported on activists putting rainbow flags all around Warsaw. And one of the um, signs was the Our Lady of Chestakova, <laughs> whom I knew from my Buffalo origins, is a Polish icon, they call her the Black Madonna. And so um, this artist, Izabeta Podieska <coughs> decorated the Our Lady of Chestakova with a rainbow flag, or you know, a rain included rainbow iconography. And so now I have a picture before you of that iconography of the rainbow flag on Our Lady of Chestakova. So this artist has been charged, and she and two other people. They've been charged with um, putting up posters on walls and elsewhere around the church. They were also charged with putting stickers with the image on garbage bins and toilets, which they deny. Uh, the Polish media identified two other defendants as Anna Pruse, Joanna Gurska Iskandar. They could face up to two years in prison if convicted and so you see, I showed you at the outset, but let's look at it again, that picture of the protesters, and they're holding a sign that says, the rainbow is not an offense in Polish. So we'll see what the outcome of that action is. I have entertainment news from Asia. There are boys love hits now. Um, and I'd like to talk in detail, if I may, uh, during a segment, if I may, about um, a series from Thailand and a series from Taiwan. And these two Asian countries are significant. Thailand may be the first South Asian country to legalize same-sex marriage. They're moving in that direction. But as you know, in 2019, Taiwan already did it. But there are two boy love one is a film and one is a series that um, are forwarding the cultural dialogue about that. And in case I don't get to it, let me just show you a picture, a still shot from one of the movies um, that is breaking records in Taiwan. Um, and the movie is called Because We Belong Together. It's a record-breaking LGBTQ blockbuster. So in case I don't get to greater detail, 
about those. Now you've seen the picture. Two more pictures of stories I'm not going to get to. The She's first is bad. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the first ever transgender candidate to run for mayor in the in Yucatan is Naomi Arjona Rosas, and there she is. She's transgender. She's been a transgender activist for years. She's very popular, so I hope she wins. And a Swiss professional basketball player, Marco Lehman, comes out as gay. He wrote an article, and there's a picture. You can see a picture of him now. He wrote an article in which he finally came out, and he said, you know, my life was so schizophrenic. I'm happy with my boyfriend. He'd drop me off, but then when I go to work, I'd have to assume a straight persona. And so he had a breakdown. He outlines the whole thing, and now he's very happy. And he said a lot of people, a lot of gay people in sports just drop out rather than pursuing it and trying to be open. So he was delayed because he didn't have any role models. Good but, for him. So those are my headlines. All right. Oh, yes. and I have to say I'm, a book review is coming up yeah. later <laughs> in the hour. You're back. There's, That's right. There's lots of pictures. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> so, right. I want to talk a little bit about the arts in New England, and I want to give a shout out and a thank you to Boston Spirit that we mentioned on our last show, and not just because they included us, <laughs> but they have made a commitment to looking at artists, writers, you know, d exhibits throughout New England that we should be supporting. And looking at some of those, there are two books of note. The first one is The Rain May Pass, and this is a memoir by Boston native Alan Shane. And they compared it in the review to Call Me By Your Name. And it's his recounting his teenage years and falling in love with a man twice his age during the 1940s. 40s. And they mm. said it was refreshing as a warm summer rain. Oh. So that's enticing. Yes. And then there's this one that made me think of maybe that Linda. Plain Bad Heroines. <laughs> and it's billed as a contemporary gothic horror novel. Ooh. It's Yeah, I know. It's got your attention Ooh. already. Written by Emily Danforth. <coughs> and Emily Danforth wrote the book upon which the film The Miseducation of Cameron Post was, was based. Mm -hmm. sure. Plain Bad Heroes, Heroines, is described as a time-hopping plot focusing on a doomed romance of two young women that haunts a Rhode Island boarding school. Ooh. Now, I'm thinking we might need to get in touch with Bear Pond to get a copy of this as a birthday gift for an upcoming <laughs> event and then get a review of it. Mm -hmm. right, okay. Music. There is pop duo called Frontlines has just released Bittersweet Revival. And part of this duo is gay Boston native John Flanagan. This is described as powerful harmonies that touch on important social and political issues such as bigotry in a long way. An anti-45 anthem called Rain. Mm -hmm. And then a song called Save Us which addresses health care. Okay, we could identify with that one. And then love is all we own about the growing social movements. Hmm. So Sounds very interesting. I know. I yeah. Would, and, and I appreciate it because I really don't go out and look for these kinds of, and knowing that there's a New England connection sort of heightens it. They also were showcasing wild, fancy designs in Northampton, and that's their website, they have local artists, LGBTQ+, using repurposed materials to create earrings, pings, pins, necklaces, patches, to announce the wearer's personal pronouns or LGBTQ identity, such as butch and queer. <laughs> I think that puts it right out there. 
And then the New Haven, Connecticut Pride Center always has a display of LGBTQ artists, mm -hmm. such as their recent exhibit called Transcending Art. <laughs> and what they're doing is they have two <coughs> other venues yeah. that they are expanding so they can show more work. And again, you could go onto their website, you know, the New Haven Pride Center, and get a virtual tour. And I wanted, oh, we, Ann and I didn't get to go when we were in Northampton, but we wanted to go to lesbian um, Emily Dickinson's house. Yes. <laughs> and, and just set up up front. And I want to leave you with a short clip. And this is from a film that when I watched the trailer, I'll, I'll tell you, I started choking up. And it's called Supernova. And it's with Colin First, F Firth and Stanley Tucci. Mm. And it's a portrayal of an aging, longtime couple facing a health care crisis. And the film uses a road trip to both reveal the crisis, reflect on their years together, which oh. got me, and how they were saying goodbye. And in the clip, it will tell you the wow. health care crisis and the importance of this film. So you have to find the three brightest lights there that make the triangle. These ones? Mm hmm And that's where the Milky Way is. Hmm. It's good to get back on the road again, don't you think? But how about just exploring the outer regions of fifth gear? <laughs> I'm on the edge. <laughs> All right, if you had one wish in the world, what would it be? I wish this holiday wouldn't end. <laughs> so can you tell that it's gotten worse? I'd like to make a speech. I, uh... Well, maybe, maybe Sam will do it for me. Yeah, I'd, I'd love, love to. to do it for me. Now, as most of you will know, I am slowly losing my ability to remember. And I definitely wouldn't be here if it weren't for this man next to me. I want to be remembered for who I was, but not for who I'm about to become. It's not fair to you. It's not about fair, it's about love. No, Sam. I want to see this through with you to the end. Costa! Hey, sorry. You know, a very wise man once said, we will not starve for lack of wonders, but from lack of wonder. Are these out now? They are scheduled to be released at the end of this month. And I did not see with the clip where we could access them. So I'm hoping that I can continue to go online and then you can post it on our site. Right, because I'd like to see that. So I'm handing it off to you now. All right, thank you. Well, for the first story I have is North Carolina cities begin passing historic non-discrimination laws after a year-long monitor monitorium. Hillsborough, Carborough, and Chapel Hill passed ordinance protecting LGBTQ from discrimination in public accommodations and employment. These are the first measures passed since the 2019 repeal of North Carolina's bathroom bill HB2. <coughs> New sheriff is first woman well, first lesbian, to hold this position in Ohio County. Sheriff Charmaine McGuffey had a conversation she will never forget with her uncle when she was 14. She was told, she told him that she wanted to be a cop like him. And he told her that was just impossible, that there was no way it was going to happen because she was a woman. But she never let that get her down 
and she kept working towards this goal, and now she's a sheriff. And we have a photo of her, which we will be showing now. And another photo is of gay representative Sean Patrick Maloney was ready to fight off the mob at the Capitol. From Hudson Valley, New York, he was ready to physically fight back against the rioters that stormed the Capitol. He was up in the uh, balcony. Gallery. Yeah, the gallery. Yeah. Is that what they call it? Mm -hmm. I was going to. All right. Yeah. But I declined. <laughs> <laughs> when it appears that the rioters has got, had gotten into the House of Representatives, Maloney turned to colleague Colin Alfred, a former pro football player, and said, are you ready to fight these mega, mega assholes? Let's go, said Alfred, who is also a Democrat and from Texas. So here's his photo. Um, oh, I was thought, that a photo of Maloney or yeah, of Alfred? Maloney. Maloney. Of Maloney, okay. And you know, I thought, doesn't this sound like a movie? Yeah, You it know, is. like I could just picture the whole thing. Are you ready? All right. Um, <laughs> And um, I have a trailer for this, but I'll tell you, it's uh, Andro Day is riveting in Bi Blue singer Billie Holiday. The U.S. versus Billie Holiday examines the government um, attempt to silence her for singing Strange Fruit. Oh, that's such a wonderful in public. song. They claim the song was vi brought on violence. And one FBI agent was uh, Garrett Holland, made it his life's mission to take her down. Here is the trailer. You can watch on Hulu on February 26th. Don't you know who this is? She was thinking of something more special. I'm downright flashy, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Billy Holiday. Reporters keep asking me, Billy, why you do the things you do? This is what I tell them. I love me. We love you. And the Blessy P says, Billy Holiday is the voice of our people. I think we should integrate the audience for this show. Let's change it up a little bit. You know, blacks and whites sitting together. You knew what you were getting yourself into when you decided to come on the road. Get out of my goddamn clothes. I'm going to take everything except your bra and your man. <laughs> Which one of my songs is your favorite song? Strange Fruit. Yeah, it's a song about important things, you know, things that are going on in the country. This holiday woman's causing a lot of people to think the wrong things. It's a starting gun for this so-called civil rights movement. Those lyrics provoke people. Y'all got a plan? She's a drug addict. Exactly. I cut strange fruit. I want to sing the damn song. It's for your own good, okay? I sing it the fuck I want. Silent trees. Get her off that stage. That strange fruit. They won't let me sing nowhere. No clubs, no money, no nothing. You gotta understand, baby. Right now, I'm in a situation. Look, you said we could beat this, Billy. I need some now. Blood on the leaves. You're like a hammer. Come right back and it hit harder than before. And blood. She's singing it for all of us. <laughs> Ain't no other Negro star bold enough to do it. Black body swinging. I'm being followed. I'm not gonna count in no fizz. In the southern breeze. She's made something of herself, and you can't take it because she's strong, beautiful, and black. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. You think I'm gonna stop singing that song? Your grandkids will be singing Strange Fruit. Arizona representative tar uh, representatives target target Cindy McCain 
for supporting Biden and LGBTQ rights. Representatives are considering censuring her, the widow of John McCain. A proposed censuring of Cindy makes personal attacks and refers to her past drug addiction. I didn't know she had a drug addiction, no, I didn't did you? Either. No. <coughs> Cindy McCain has been a proponent of LGBTQ rights and was given the Trevor Hero Award in 2018. So, and lesbian teen outs her mother, her mother's involvement in the DC violence at the Capitol. <laughs> Elena Duke was told by her mother to get out of the house that she wasn't welcome there because she was a lesbian and participated in a Black Lives Matter protest. Helena identified her mother and her aunt and uncle in videos. So, good there for her. we are. Hey, I back. know. I know. I, and, and the last um, story I have is about attorney and lesbian Roberta Kaplan is about to make Trump's life extremely difficult. She's a crusader for underdogs and has won almost every legal um, accolade imaginable. Kaplan says that she will seek to dispose Trump in three cases. She's a lesbian. Depose. Yeah, depose, sorry. <laughs> We'd like to dispose of him. Yeah. <laughs> Could we? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> She's a lesbian, observant Jew, and a diehard Democrat. She's been called the Attorney General for the Resistance. Kaplan remains most celebrated for the Edie Windsor case in 2013. Roberta married Rachel Levine in 2005. Rachel is a liberal activist who serves on the New York, New York Democratic Committee. So, there you go. Well, I have a book review, and I think in the interest of time, I will deliver it now. Um, and if there's time, I'll get back to some of my other uh, stories, especially about the uh, films and entertainment. Do you want to hold the book up? Why, yes. Or I will. Here. You can put it right here if that works. This review is truncated, so I hope it's not choppy. Um, it appeared in the Lambda Literary Review on November 15th. It's of this um, volume, which, of, which is of some length. And of one of my favorite periods in history. Lesbian history? Lesbian history. <clears throat> Diana Suhami's deliberately provocative title, No Modernism Without Lesbians, points to the nature of her project to place lesbian life and work prominently in the cultural landscape of modernism. Literary modernism is favored in the analysis, though uh, the lesbian Suhami discusses also participated to varying degrees in modernist painting, music, theater, and architecture. The writer expands her definition of modernism to embrace nonconformist lifestyle particularly in the case of Natalie Clifford Barney. Besides railway heiress Barney, the writer also considers shipping scion Briar, which is the chosen name of Annie Winifred Ellerman. Um, Sylvia Beach is also considered the owner of the legendary Shakespeare and Company bookstore and the only member of the group who's not independently wealthy. Um, and finally, experimental writer and art collector Gertrude Stein is um, treated at length. The setting is Paris, where each figure lived and worked most of her life. Three women were U.S. expatriates. Breyer was originally from the U.K. After a short introduction, the book is divided into four sections, each devoted to the life and loves of these chosen figures. Perhaps of greatest interest to contemporary readers are the sections concerning Sylvia Beach and Breyer, two women occupying back seats in the popular annals of modernism and lesbian lore. Beach's bookstore became the center of the literary avant-garde 
from 1919 until it was forced to close by the Nazis in 1941. She spent years with other lesbians like Margaret Anderson and Harriet Weaver fighting the censors to publish James Joyce's modernist classic Ulysses. What is less known to contemporary readers, perhaps, is that she enjoyed a lifelong lesbian relationship with a fellow bookstore owner, Adrienne Monnier, whose French bookstore was across the street. Despite Monnier's decision to open their relationship while Beach was visiting in the U.S., the two remained lifelong allies, and in fact, Monnier was instrumental in securing Beach's release on health grounds from a Nazi jail in 1943. Breyer is another modernist who may have escaped rec popular recognition, except perhaps as the companion and benefactor of Hilda Doolittle, a modernist poet and U.S. expatriate who went by the initials H.D. Though unable to openly de declare it, Breyer may be described in contemporary parlance as transgender. She devoted much of her in inherited largesse to small presses and the aesthetic undertakings of her friends and other struggling artists, and she participated in some of these projects herself. An unaccountable omission occurs, unfortunately, in Suhami's treatment of the last years of the life of Natalie Clifford Barney. One reversal came with her eviction from the site of her salon on Rue Jacob, where she lived for 60 years. Though wealthy and well-connected, she was still a renter, and at 93 was forced to leave her storied and treasured locale in late 1969 or early 1970. More devastating was Barney's late life estrangement from the artist Romaine Brooks, who had been her lover and partner for decades. In the introduction, Suhami misleadingly states, Natalie's relationship with Romaine lasted 54 years until Romaine's death in 1970. In the last year of her life, however, Brooks turned away from Barley, Barney entirely, and despite Barney's plaintive letters and the housekeeper, housekeeper, housekeeper Berta's attempted intervention, sank deep into isolation that deliberately excluded Barney. She famously said, I am not at home to Miss Barney. It's really... Um, I wonder what happened. Rather than including this poignant, heartbreaking material, Suhami creates a fiction of lasting love. At the end of the Barney section, after quoting a 1964 love letter from Barney to Brooks, Suhami declares that a photo of Brooks was buried with Barney. Key particulars are overlooked here. This mishap raises troubling questions about narratives of this nature. If we're going to reclaim the lives and work of our lesbian predecessors, we need to provide accurate information. Though the temptation to mythologize and romanticize is great, we do so at our peril. In a work of this length and scope, minor errors and failings inevitably appear as well. British heiress, heiress and activist Nancy Cunard was a heterosexual friend, not Barney's, one of Barney's lovers. A clear anti-Bloomsbury bias emerges, a number of sweeping assertions call for more circumspection, and the Gertrude Stein reference list suits, omits several notable titles. Still No Modernism Without Lesbians partially accomplishes its goal of providing an informative, diverting account aimed at returning certain Paris lesbians to their rightful places in lesbian modernist study. Many contemporary readers may dismiss these women as rich white girls, in the words of an activist contemporary of mine. And of course, that is to a large extent true. But in the context of their lives and of the times, their work has merit and deserves recognition on its own terms. Diana Suhami in this volume 
has made a significant contribution toward that effort. I studied all this. Her <laughs> I don't know if you can tell. Her dissertation was on this. On Judah Barnes, yeah. but that's another. So, so it's, uh, I'm glad I read it, but it's flawed. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. Well, Keith, do you have anything else, or should we let Ann ramble on? Well, I, I saw one thing that I had overlooked, and if I can find it very quickly, it was well, an acknowledgment. Well, there was an acknowledgment that the Boston Children's Hospital, they are going to delay gender affirmation services, surgeries, for people born as intersex until the person reaches age of meaningful consent. <coughs> Which is what age? 14? No, no, no. It, it is going to be dependent upon the person. When, when can you make this decision? They're only the second hospital in the country to institute this policy. But I'm not sure I understand. So, okay, if, if someone is born and identified as being intersex, intersex yeah. ambiguous yeah. gender, Traditionally, the hospital will persuade the parents to engage in a gender affirmation process One way or the other. immediately. Right. And by work from the intersex activists, they said, wait a minute, you're making decisions about who I am before I have the ability or the awareness to understand the implications of that decision. And that has screwed up a lot of people's yeah, lives. Absolutely. Did you read, um, what was the book, um, Middlesex? Yeah. No. Yeah. But, no, I, I didn't read it. I talked about that a lot. Yeah. Um, and that was the really first big book, I think, about that, that issue. If I, I really exactly. liked the book a lot. But um, <clears throat> so what is the age of consent, though? Do they? Do they, they, they do not establish it because it's going to be based upon the oh, individual. The individual. OK. So you could be. So. 10 or 5 or 20. It's when you have the capacity to say, I understand, and this is who I am. Okay. Got and it. I think it's really a good idea to get rid of that practice. Absolutely. I just wonder who decides and what's meaningful and, you know. I would say that would be the same as end-of-life decisions where you have an ethics committee who is looking at the totality of the decision being made and what is your understanding of so but it will it will be definitely be in the details mm -hmm. but this is a, a very encouraging step do parents don't know this before their children are born do they no no okay so it's not something that you would know no okay and a lot of parents i think are well meaning but they really you know, it's have a no, terrible practice. I have no understanding. You know, but they may, you know, it, it could be, you know, like a parent saying, well, I have three daughters, so well, let's make this person a son, or who I knows know it, what, but, you know? I know, you know, it's arbitrary. I know. And, it's you not, know, has no, um, no basis. recognition. Yeah, yeah. Of Nothing about me without me. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, well Ann, you have I do. Stories? I have an okay. opportunity to cover I, another story. Yeah. Um, Look at a smile on her face. I know. I know I'm <laughs> delighted. Because I think this is very interesting what's happening in Asia. It's a boy's love uh, series of genres that are appearing. Um, and they push the dial for progress across Asia. Um, two, vo two boys love hits have recently rocked the LGBT plus hubs in Asia uh, particularly in Thailand and Taiwan. Two together, the series, which includes Because We Belong Together and um, Your Name Engraved Herein. Is this like TV series? One's a TV series and one's a film. Okay. And I'm going to cover them sequentially. Okay. Um, they have added to the reputation of both countries because of these vibrant LGBTQ scenes. Because We Belong Together was one of Thailand's biggest hit shows in 2020. The series aired on primetime television and online channels, receiving record views and racking up several local awards. 
It's based on Jit to Rain, a writer I don't know, <laughs> on their novel. The story centers on freshman college love between Sarah Watt, an introvert athlete and guitarist, and Tyne. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, T-I-N-E. A self-proclaimed womanizer who becomes attracted to men for the first time when he falls with for Sarawat. The series' popularity is seen in its reaching 9 million YouTube views in the first weeks and 15 million at press time. Wow. It's also received 50 million views on Line TV one of Asia's largest streaming oh. platforms. Its success has many sources. It's easily relatable because of the theme of love and genuine portrayal of what lesbian youth experience as they come of age, while retaining cute boy romance attributes and fun college life, attracting larger non-LGBT audiences, cool. apparently. It speaks to audiences in Thailand and across East and Southeast Asia, from Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, to Vietnam. It even found fans in Brunei, Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia, where same-sex sodomy laws still exist. Its sequel, Still Together, released several months later, received even greater attention, with its last episode taking the top trending hashtag in Thailand with over two million tweets. As with Because We Belong Together, its online response was phenomenal, with over 40 million views on YouTube and 27 million views on Line TV, spanning East and Southeast Asia. Um, its well-received audience is not coincidental with social progress seen in the country. As we, I said in the intro, Thailand is well positioned to become the first Southeast Asian nation to recognize same-sex unions. The Thai parliament is currently discussing a bill to legalize same-sex partnerships, along with provisioning other benefits similar to marriage. And I, along with Taiwan, which legalized marriage in 2019, as I said, both Asian countries have fundamental progress have seen fundamental progress with acceptance of openly LGBTQ relationships, both legal reforms and social attitudes. And now, if I yeah. may continue, yeah. I'd like to let me ask a question. <clears throat> do, do you know if these are subtitled? Is it something that you can I don't watch know. on YouTube or in the United States? I don't think so. That's okay. our homework. Okay. Yeah, I could. I'll double check, but I'm fearful. That it's not. Okay. But um, now let me show you again a still shot from your name engraved herein, which uh, is, it shares a universally relatable romantic theme, and it's from Taiwan. It's a record breaking 2020 LGBT blockbuster. Um, it was the first LGBT-themed movie to break the $1 million mark, a prestige badge of success, badge of success in the Taiwanese and greater Chinese-speaking film industry. The lead actors have been strong advocates for greater LGBT social acceptance. Given the success, of both hits in two of Asia's most LGBT-friendly countries, it can be expected that there will be more LGBTQ-themed pieces with mainstream success to look forward to. Although boys and boy love, this genre, arguably objectifies attractive young, preppy-looking gay couples, <coughs> it nevertheless helps raise awareness around the existence and creating lacking dialogue around normalizing LGBTQ relationships. With more visibility given to same-sex relationships as they become more open and discussed, this is a welcome departure from a patriarchal and anti-gay don't-ask, don't-tell approach still present 
in Asia and abroad. Mm. This is very exciting. Yeah. Everybody's watching it in Asia. <laughs> I wish we could watch it. I, I wonder know. if it has subtitles, so we'll have to check. I'll, I'll report on that next time. Um, and? Well, how much more do you have, Keith? I've got another clip I could do. No, I, I'm the only, all I have is the answer to the trivia question. <laughs> well, in that case... Let's show the clip. Let me show you the clip. This is from The Handmaiden from South Korea. That's right. It's adapted from Sarah Waters' novel, mm -hmm. Fingersmith. I like that novel. Let me set it up, and then we can watch the clip. Um, we know that Sarah Waters is a British lesbian, an award-winning novelist, who first caught the attention of literary lesbians with Tipping the Velvet, a work of historical fiction that found and traced the deeply embedded lesbian veins of Victorian England. Fingersmith, her third novel, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, and while we could call it a lesbian novel, being both both written by and about lesbians. It's also a work greatly admired by men. It was ranked by David Bowie as one of the, his top 100 books. And South Korean film director Park Chan-wook was inspired by its visceral scenes. I, I'll tell you one in particular that one of the characters files off the teeth of another one with a thimble. Yeah. Um, so he, that's a visceral scene that inspired him. Um, he felt compelled to make it into his next movie, The Handmaiden. According to an interview with The Guardian, Park didn't know the BBC adaptation existed, and when he found out, he resolved to transplant it from its British soil to 1930s Japan, a period which had its own Victorian-type constraints via a final flourishing of imperialist power. Oh. At that time, Korea, like much of the region, was challenged by or under Japanese imperialist rule. And while Japan looked down upon Korea, it looked enviously to the West. In The Handmaiden, Park cleverly maps those master-servant tensions onto an Asian colonial context to stunning effect. Oh. While Sarah Waters was thrilled with the 2005 adaptation by the, of the BBC story, the heroine Sue, um, she hasn't seen this version. In the story, the heroine Sue is a female pickpocket raised by a Dickensian gang of thieves. She collaborates with a male con man, gentleman in this film, to seduce a wealthy heiress in her remote country estate, elope with her, and abscond with her fortune after committing her to a madhouse. Okay, so the Dickensian yeah, guy like wants the, to... Yeah. Linda and I saw a play of this at the American Repertory Theater. It was still called Fingersmith. Yeah. And we didn't think it was that effective as a play. It's a lot of it twists a, and turns in the plot. It was better at the book. Okay, when Sue falls in love with her mistress, she nevertheless goes through with the plot, and that's just part one. Okay. Many twists and turns follow in the remaining two parts. In the novel, as in others by Waters, dramatic suspense is provided by psychological atmosphere of the Gothic novel. The cliffhanger device favored by early serials, the duplicity of language, especially the argo of the criminal underclass, and the ever-present threat of the gallows to raise the stakes. All right, are we going to see the clip? Oh, you don't want to hear any more about it? <laughs> well, well, we have to We have to allow time for the clip. The what? The, the clip. The clip, yeah. Let's, all right, let's look <laughs> at the clip. <laughs>
내가 여 죽으시 되어라. 바로 둘만 있을 기회를 만들어줘. 난 거짓말만 하지 마. 알았니? 당신은 나를 탐하고 불쌍한 조선인 하녀라고 생각하겠지. 아이프렌즈컷미오프아이엠이어프레셔블아이엠이어프레셔블아이엠이어프레셔블아이엠이어프레셔블아이엠이어프레셔블아이엠이어프레셔블아이엠이어프레셔블아이엠이어프레셔블